Hello everyone. I'm Hans Engel from the Directors Guild of Canada. Welcome to our 18th episode of DGC Masterclass via Zoom. These are unprecedented times beyond anyone's imagining, which makes me even more grateful that you are joining us tonight. With these masterclasses, we're going behind the scenes and talking to some of the top creatives in the industry in Canada and internationally, covering directors, designers, picture and sound editors with a new episode or two every week. You'll receive a new invitation with a specific link to tune in, and I'm also posting the links on my Instagram. So far, we've had Emmy-winning director Jean-Marc Vallée, Emmy-winning editor Kelly Dixon, Oscar-winning designers David and Sandy Wasco, a special event with brilliant Indigenous filmmaker Jeff Barnaby, two-time Oscar-nominated doc filmmaker Faraz Fayyad, two-time Oscar-winning sound editor Karen Baker-Landers, Oscar and Palm d'Or nominee Adam Agoyan, Oscar-nominated designers uh, uh, K.K. Barrett and Patrice Vermet, Maverick filmmaker Bruce McDonald, Oscar-nominated director, writer, producer, and actor Sarah Pauly, groundbreaking director Clement Virgo in conversation with Cameron Bailey, history-making 2019 Academy Award-winning production designer Hannah Beekler, prolific director and actor Helen Shaver, Oscar-winning legendary Star Wars picture editor Paul Hirsch, award-winning groundbreaking director Mina Shum, and renowned director, writer, and actor Casey Lemons. All those can be found on the DGC National and DGC Ontario YouTube channels. Tonight is a special Newfoundland edition of our Masterclass series where we're celebrating the release of a DGC director's new film, and both our guests are from beautiful Newfoundland. Our moderator is one of Canada's most recognizable stars, best known for his leading role in the hit CBC television drama comedy, Republic of Doyle. In addition to its six season run on CBC, Republic of Doyle has sold to markets around the world, including syndication across the US. His feature film credits include major roles in director Bruce McDonald's award-winning film, Weirdos, Paul Gross's Hyena Road, and Michael Melsky's The Child Remains. His company, Take the Shot Productions, is currently in pre-production for season three of the award-winning show Frontier, starring Jason Momoa on Netflix Worldwide and Discovery Channel Canada. He was featured in seasons one and two and serves as executive producer. His latest self-generated project, CBC's limited series Caught, aired in 2018. He led the cast and served as the showrunner and executive producer. He recurs as a guest star in season two of Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, produced by Carlton Hughes, starring John Krasinski for Amazon Studios. Welcome, Alan Hawko. There he is. Hey, hi everyone. Welcome, yes. Alan. Great to have hey. you here. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for, um, for including me in this really cool thing you're doing. Absolutely, a pleasure. Wouldn't have it any other way. Now, tonight's featured guest is an award-winning writer and director of film and television. His films have screened at various festivals around the world, including TIFF and Fantastic Fest, and are revered for their unique blend of fantasy and drama, along with their classical shooting style. An alumnus of the prestigious Canada Film Centre in Toronto, his debut feature, Cast of Shadow, nominated four Canadian Screen Awards, including Best Picture and his sophomore feature titled Hammer, starring Will Patton and Mark O'Brien, was released this past Friday on all major VOD platforms, and we'll be talking about Hammer tonight. His next, next feature will be an adaptation of Michael Crummy's a survivalist novel, Sweetland in 2021. It's a, an amazing novel and one of my favorite novelists. Welcome, Christian Sparks. Hey, Hans, thanks for having me. Welcome, great hey, to have you here. Fabulous film. Thank you, that's a uh, esteemed company we're in uh, tonight. I got nervous when you were reading out those names. <laughs> well, it's entirely appropriate. It's fantastic to have you guys part of the series. Thanks. Now, before I turn it over to uh, Alan and Christian, I'd like to point out to our viewers the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to send in questions throughout the masterclass by using that button. Type them in there and Alan will get to them uh, as he can. We'll try to get to as many as possible 
but he may not be able to ask all of them. That's it for me. Alan, Christian, over to you. Thanks, Hans. Thanks, Hans. Uh, Christian, buddy, how are you? Good, man. How you doing? I'm, uh, I'm very well. I was giving you the head nod there uh, while Hans was talking. You didn't, uh, you didn't give me the head nod back. I'm a little Sorry, offended. My, my bad, my bad. Well, we talk all the time. You know, you know we're good. <laughs> was uh, okay. So we're both from. Uh, I live in Newfoundland, Labrador. You're in Toronto, correct? Uh, yes, from from St. John certainly. But I moved to Toronto in January past. Yeah. Why? Uh, why? Why did you leave us? Um. <laughs> Honestly, I think I was just a little bit sick of myself. I was, I was living in a great house, um, as you know, like only 10 minutes away from where you are now. So like I had two acres in the woods by the ocean. Uh, it, it's a good life, it's a comfortable life, but uh, very kind of isolated. And I've been operating in a, in a vacuum uh, more or less for my entire career. Um, and I've got some really great collaborators at home and stuff, but uh, I was kind of getting tired of myself and the days just spent, yeah, uh, you know, working in a vacuum in that house. I was ready to start participating in the world. Uh, so I figured I would move up to Toronto and uh, expand my network. And uh, just in time, I missed Snowmageddon that you guys had, but I was right on time for COVID. So then, bam. So <clears throat> the vacuum. So let's talk a little bit about uh, your backstory, like for, for everyone listening. I know your work, obviously know you, um, mm -hmm. big fan. Uh, you're from town, so you know. I always found it growing up myself in a in a smaller sort of uh, town outside town. Uh, like I look back at it, and I wonder how you know that I entered into this business and how I thought it would be viable and all that. So, what was your story? How did you? Why did you get? Where did you get the bug? Like, did you have an influence young? Was it like Greg Malone? Did you see like fucking Andy Jones and Greg Malone? Or, no, like, not at all. I mean, I grew up on the west end of town and was very much like um, one of four uh, four boys. Um, so I had no real, um, I was mostly sports with us, uh, you know, other than like, you know, beating the streets and causing trouble. <laughs> You know, played a lot of sports. I was always a huge film buff, um, but was never involved in any of the arts community. It never even really occurred to me that like filmmaking was something you could do for a living because I just like no one I knew did it or really even had a camera. Um, and this was even just in the like in the late 80s and 90s in St. John's. Um, but painting and drawing was always kind of my thing, was always what I was pretty good at. My dad is a really or was a really um, talented artist. He passed away uh, recently. And uh, so I went away to art school and my first semester, someone said, you know, did you hear they're getting a film program next semester? Where'd you go, where'd you go to art school? I went to NASCAD in Halifax. And again, I had always been a huge film buff my, my whole life. My older brother, Ian, was a big influence. He was really big into horror films. He had like a subscription of Fangoria magazine. His whole room was covered in film posters. So. You know, he would get me to skip school a, a lot and we would, uh, in high school and stuff, and we would, we would watch movies during the day. So I was always a big fan, but it wasn't until that day in art school uh, when someone told me in the cafeteria that they're doing a film program that I said, uh, as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. And I enrolled and uh, here we are. And you got in. Uh, yeah, so I got in. Uh, sorry, I was no, like, I know, I know. I, I, I wasn't leading you anywhere. I was the genuine. I was like wondering if you were trying to hide the fact that you didn't get in, or if you were being hum. So why did like why did you get in? What did you have to do to kind of get into that part of it? Did you have to make a film, or were you? No, I think. Well, I already got into uh, the film school at that point, um, based on like the the kind of painting and drawing and design stuff that I had done. Um, and then in order to get to the film program, all you had to do was enroll because it was, it was a brand new program. And on the East Coast of Canada, there were only so many people who were um, uh, applying. So uh, yeah, I, I applied and I got in. I think it was probably like a dozen of us in that program. And uh, you know, one of my close friends and cinematographers I, I still work with to this day, Scott McClellan, who a lot of people in Canada will know, very talented DP. Um, he attended that program with me and uh, we've worked together ever since. And yeah, I'm gonna ask you about the team thing because you, you, I notice, I know a lot of actors you work with and reuse and, mm -hmm. and uh, 
you know, when you when you were done there, so you went to uh, film center, right? You went to the Canadian Film Center. Yeah. So I did I did a four year film program at um, NASCAD, and then I came home to St. John's, basically just figuring out what I was going to do. Just worked in a restaurant for like a year, like um, uh, just in the kitchen. I had done that all through film school. That's how I kind of paid the bills. And uh, I made a short film with a friend of mine named Matt Tucker called A Foot of Rope. It was like a, a mockumentary about a dog catcher, actually, in a small town. And, uh, you know, we made it for like no money, just, just we borrowed some gear. And uh, Matt had been a lifelong friend of mine, great guy, very creative guy in his own right. And uh, the film did really well. And it, uh, it won like best picture at the, uh, at the Nickel Film Festival which is St. John's, it's a, uh, it's a running film festival, a great little film festival started, started by uh, Roger Monder. And uh, that was like all the encouragement I kind of needed to keep going. Did Roger start the nickel? Yeah. Roger started the nickel. Uh, I'm pretty sure, not the theater, the, the festival itself, yeah. I'm gonna fact check that. I didn't know that, I'm, I'm shocked, I didn't know, I can't believe I didn't know that. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm pretty sure that's true. Uh, shout out to Roger, wherever he is. Um, yeah, and so, uh, and so that kind of lit the fire underneath me. And um, very soon after, I got a job at a local production company in St. John's called Best Boy Productions. Um, and I met, a, uh, I met a, a, a young woman there named Allison White. She came in uh, applying for a, in an editor position. And uh, we got her to edit some footage we had uh, of some show, and she did a great job. And um, and uh, sorry, my wife is just giving me signals in the background there, telling me not to touch my face. My, where's my wife? My, I know like, she's, she always does that. Doesn't thing. care if I touch my face. Apparently, uh, uh, I did get confirmation. Roger did start the nickel, but it's from Allison White. Uh, she just texted me. Nice. Yeah, so, so Allison, yeah, so I met Allison and she did a great job. She got the job as an editor, to make a long story short. And um, very soon after, she got into producing and then produced a short film of, uh, that we made together called A River in the Woods that got into TIFF. Um, and off the strength of that, I applied to the Canadian Film Center, did the director's program there. And uh, very shortly after that, I, uh, I applied to Telefilm's first micro-budget program where they were giving up the 250 grand to uh, make your first feature film. So I, uh, I pitched uh, a local author who you know well, an actor, uh, Joel Hines, on uh, repurposing a bunch of his material. Right. Uh, he had a novella called uh, Say Nothing Saw Wood that I quite liked. And uh, I pitched him on combining that with elements of poems that he had done and adding a troll. And uh, he went for the pitch and like, Six months later, we were funded, and like nine months later, we shot it. I think it, it's a very quick turnaround. So, do you, do, uh, yeah, and I know. I mean, that's cast no shadow. So, uh, we'll um, we'll sh is it another great film that I I was like very loosely involved with, and I should have staged my office to have uh, your your poster behind me. But uh, all good. All good. It's here. The so. At the CFC, like just coming up, was there anyone? Did you have people who were like, who were the people that you were kind of like really drawn to in their work and like your influences that way? Was there, you know, I like I met Dan McIver, for example, like as an actor mm -hmm. and as a writer, and he kind of just, you know, blew my mind. And mm -hmm. do, who are those people for you? Um, well, honestly, man, I'm one of four boys, so like I grew up on a like solid diet of like Schwarzenegger and Stallone and Van Damme. You know, we'd only make it halfway through the movie before like shirts were being ripped off and dad was like coming, <laughs> over, coming over stairs, you know, yelling at us. That was like a classic film going experience for the entire eighties in my home. Sure, sure, um, same, same, yeah. Yeah, so I kind of grew up on a lot of that material. It's not like in St. John's, you know, you're not getting the local art house cinema or, you know, at the video stores you go to, they typically only have um, the like mainstream fair. Uh, so, by the way, had there are no video stores yes, anymore. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Which uh, I lament. But um, yeah. so, yeah, so I, I wasn't exposed to any great like art cinema. If anything, it was more kind of like um, uh, painting was a big thing. My dad is a, was a really great, uh, really great artist, and always encouraged us to paint and draw and create, no matter what it was, from a young age. And we often did quite well with that. So that's where my like 
I guess my artistic streak really started to flourish. I was kind of known for that in school and growing up. And then, um, you know, I'd say probably around age 12 or 13, I started seeing like those films kind of slip in and make an impression. Like I remember somehow I had seen a copy of um, uh, Mean Streets that someone had. And I had, at a really young age, had seen Clockwork Orange actually. Somehow, um, someone, that, probably my older brother Ian, uh, had showed it to me and it made a, uh, made a big impression on me. It was one of the first times that I was like, I wondered who had made it. You often hear people say that. And that was one of the first films where it really struck a chord with me with having such a strong voice. I wonder who made it. And then I went to National Video on Tops of the Road and asked them if they had any more Kubrick films. And, I really, and then I discovered that he had made The Shining, which I had, I had uh, already seen by that point. So that's when I started to kind of progress into more having a keen interest in film. Up to that point, it had, it had been more just kind of like renting movies with my brothers at Alan's video. You remember Alan's on Tops of the Road? I was gonna reference it when we were talking about the death of the video story, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, for, for years they had uh, seven for seven seventy seven. So we would traipse up and get seven VHSs. You know, you'd make your way in the snow, it would be like a half day's journey. Uh, you oh, yeah. cut, cut through concrete products and up the hill and you'd arrive soaking wet at Alan's video and you'd spend an hour or two thawing out, picking movies and then make your way back home and then you'd watch them each 10 times, you know? And you came out and the, your, you mentioned your father and stuff. What, what did your old man do? He was in, uh, he was a high school art teacher. Um, so he, he was an art teacher, that was his profession. Um, but he was also a really talented self-taught artist. Um, and a lot of people from St. John's will know his work. Um, he's really captured uh, life and culture in St. John's over the years. Um, started off watercolor and then um, turned to acrylic and has amassed a large body of work and is a highly respected uh, artist uh, in Newfoundland. And just overall, amazing, amazing man. I mean, he, uh, you know, coached all our sports teams. He was a real Renaissance man, beloved by all my, all my friends. Yeah, a real, real classic character. That's great. And do, was there any other uh, artists in the, in the family? Anyone else kind of move into it? Mm, not, not really. I have an Aunt Elaine, my father's sister, who's a great singer, like even like opera style singer. Um, very talented, but no, not really. You're the one, you're the one in the, in the group. You're the one in the fam who got yeah, bit. Well, certainly with, with, with film, yeah. I mean, as you know, in like, you know, there's a couple of pioneers in St. John's, like the Paul Popes and, and those people of the world who, who like, um, who got film going, like Greg and Andy, like the Klaus's Big Good, those early films that were made in the province, but there weren't a lot of them. It's only as we were starting to come of age, uh, basically when it went from analog to digital, that more people could suddenly now make films on their own and the industry really expanded. Uh, yeah, it was experience. like Mary, Mary and, 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 and Barbara and Janice and Rosemary. Yeah, there was like a, they were the, and Pope obviously, the pioneers of built laying the, the road. So uh, I wanted to kind of jump in about, uh, we're talking about your family. So I want to get, I want to, I want to talk about Hammer because Hammer is out. Mm -hmm. We can touch on Cast No Shadow later. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about Hammer. Hammer is the movie that everyone should go buy right now. It's on iTunes and it's on uh, Crave and all that shit. You can buy it. Um, I got it for free and I still bought it and it's great. And uh, our, our friend Mark O'Brien is in it and a great cast. But I think uh, we should probably play the trailer. Sure. Uh, the trailer for Hammer just to give everyone, it's a short one. This is a teaser, yeah, a 30 second teaser. Yeah. Um, let me see if I can get that going. Okay, that was great. Um, I really... You're close. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So while we're waiting for that, I'll just wait for Hans to text me about it. But um, this film, just give us a little breakdown of what the, the film is. What's the film about? Why is it called Hammer? Don't, uh, yeah, just give me the, the, pre the, give me the premise of what the film's about. Um, well, I guess in a nutshell, the film is, um, it's about a middle-aged man who realizes that his son is involved in crime 
and he has to go into that world in order to try and protect his son. Uh, along the way, they end up doing some pretty violent, kind of heinous uh, activities that threaten to kind of destroy the relationship. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of a pulpy, real-time crime thriller that takes place in a very small town, more or less in the suburbs and some surrounding cornfields. And, um, and it also has, um, you know, really rich elements that have to do with families and secrets and lies. So it's a pulpy kind of thrilling film, but it's also rooted in like kind of rich themes that have to do with family. I think we got the trailer here ready to go. Great. Good, thanks. How are you? The purpose of your visit? What's going on? I muted uh, so that my uh, mic wouldn't take over the uh, the trailer. So we have uh, your, we, you know, that movie starts stars obviously our friend Mark O'Brien. We have him standing by. I think we should bring him in for to the chat. What do you think? Sure, man. Yeah, Marco, let's see him. <laughs> I love that his email address comes up. Mm -hmm. Hello. You you look amazing. Hey. <laughs> Are you on the floor? What? <laughs> Hello. You're, you're totally sideways. Oh fuck. <laughs> <Is that all? laughs> you think I know how to work this thing by now? Are you in a German disco? <laughs> <laughs> how'd you know? No, I have a. I, this is a light. Otherwise, I'd be in complete darkness. Uh, I don't Mark know. Mark O'Brien. Zoom out. Ladies and gentlemen, Mark O'Brien. <laughs> how are you, buddy? You had fun? Uh, great job in the film. Really, really nice work, I have to say, Mark. Uh, I'm not just saying it because people are watching and uh, there's a director here who might hire me. I think you were great. <laughs> Thanks, man. Um, the, the movie's great. So, uh, you know, how how did you guys end up working on this movie together? Like, what was the, what was the, how, what was the journey to get you guys together on this? Christian? Uh, well, Mark and I had, uh, had known each other, I guess, what, like for 15, love affair for what, 15 years? 15 years on and off, very tempestuous relationship. Um, and uh, we had actually worked, there's a, a local uh, a co-op, a great co-op in St. John's that we all know about called um, NIFCO. And they make, uh, anyone can come in off the street and make uh, the first time film for free. And so Mark was making, I think it was, you were making your first film, right? That's where we met? Yeah, yeah. I was doing, uh, I was doing sound. I was, doing, I was like booming and recording. Uh, and I, think, I think you were only there for one day. You were like, I gotta go. We were like, all right. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I'd had enough. I'd seen one day and I was like, I'm out. Uh, and so, yeah, and so we became friends pretty quickly. And then uh, I remember shortly thereafter we were hanging out and you had shown me a movie you had made named uh, Police Cop Six. And I hadn't seen the previous five, but I knew by six that he was a cinematic genius. So that now I wanted to work together. So 15 years later, I, uh, when, I, when I wrote this film, I figured I would, uh, he was the first person that, that I thought of. And in all seriousness- Because of my work in Police Cop Six? <laughs> yeah, it was just the vision displayed in that in that project. Makes I've sense. seen that project. I have. So, he shows everybody when you come over to his house. You can't get it. Can't get actually, that, there actually is a large amount of truth to that. <laughs> but uh, no, but um, yeah. So I uh, when I wrote this script, Mark was definitely at the top of my list. I knew I knew we would have a, um, a shorthand, which proved to be really valuable uh, when we were when we were making the movie. And I knew we we liked a lot of the same film, so. It's kind of the, the best case scenario, really. Um, Mark, how did you, uh, what was your favorite thing about working with Mr. Sparks? Um, it was his, uh, his adornment of me. Uh, I found very appealing. <laughs> it immediately attracted me. Uh, uh, no, and, uh, 
<laughs> you, I mean, the fortune you were paid. The, uh, the fortune I paid. Uh, how much you liked me and um, getting Will Patton's autograph. No, it. Uh, I, I, it. I just. I wanted to work with Christian. You know, I. I, I was a big fan of all of his short films and Cast No Shadow and and everything he'd done. I was really excited by. So, I actually remember waking up uh, to a text from from you, and I was immediately. I was like excited right away. I was like, oh great. And then, uh, and then I read the script, and I, I just really liked it because I thought it was. Um, it, it, it is what the film is: is that it's an actual human story, but it's it's under the umbrella of like a genre thriller kind of movie. Which I just think that that's really smart when you get that when the audience thinks they're going in to see one thing, and they give them actually more than that. Uh, I like that, and I also like that the role. Christian just he wrote it really just like they're real people, and they're not uh, exaggerated at all. I just thought that that was really um, um, uh, mature because a lot of scripts don't do that. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a cool thing um, about your performance, Mark, and everybody's performance. And there's a funny thing with us, right, Christian, where, I mean, Mark's a director too, but, you know, it's not often we get directors who are... Uh, um, super focused on performance. So I'm curious about that. Like, you know, how did that work for you guys? You, you're transform, you transform Mark, and then at the same time, you're you in the best possible way, which I feel like is the hardest thing to accomplish, you know? I feel like that's what all the greats are doing, you know? Oh, thanks, man. I think it's, to, to go back to what you are saying about how uh, great things working with Christian is that um, what, I, what I thought about the character was that it was the first time it was a lot of me in there because it was like, this guy should seem educated. He should seem like smart, he should know better. And that'll make it more interesting as opposed to playing him like rough and tumble, kind of like a villainous kind of thuggy kind of guy. I was like, it just doesn't work. Like he's not like mm. that. I think it's more interesting, which Christian had already laid blueprint for that and, and mentioned that to me. But also with Christian working, like you were saying, working with performance and actors, which you don't get. I mean, you get it like 10% of the time. I don't know, what do you think, Kako? Like, Something like that. Most, a lot of times you don't want it when you do get it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, oh, I'm joking. I'm, no, I'm joking. And, no, we barely get it. It's true. It's like stand there and I'll see you later. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then you're like, what's the reminder about that, it? Just quick reminder that this is a director's guild uh, that's putting this off. Not you guys. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not you guys. None of them. Other directors. None of them. <laughs> this, only the Swedish ones. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, but, but Christian does a great thing that I've never seen before. And Alan, I don't know if you've seen it before. It's like, we'll do the scene and then he'll be like, cool, let's do it again. And then we'll do it again. And we're on a tight schedule, but still we do it two, two to four times. And then he'd be like, that's great. We're in the zone now. Let's keep going. And we're like, oh, because we found it now, kind of. And we've massaged it a little bit. And now it's gotten to a place that's good. And then Christian always be like, we got it. You want to try something completely different? Which, as an actor, you're like, that's great. That's exactly what I want here. Yeah, and it was, uh, it was just important for me. I think, um, Mark, you can maybe attest to this because you're quite familiar with my, my work. It's that um, I was definitely more kind of like, um, I tended to be more focused on the look and the feel of a lot of projects leading up to this point. I definitely obviously took performance seriously, but um, I often shot very formally in the past. And, and I probably didn't maybe give as much attention to actors as I would like or I wanted to because as a director, sometimes you just don't know what to say to actors. Um, it can be challenging, especially when you're making a low budget film. I think a lot of directors out there will know. It's like um, you don't have the time to do a lot of the things you want to do. Sometimes you don't even get to rehearse. You know, you can do three takes, you're already behind on your day, you're losing locations, there's a lot of issues. So it's like you're trying to make the thing look good and you don't always have time or know what to say to the actors in particular because you're, you're kind of stressed and it's, it, it just, that comes over time, I think, for a lot of directors. And well, it's interesting. The first day we shot was the heist scene at the beginning, and yeah. we didn't shoot anything till after lunch. I don't know if you mentioned that, to Alan, but that's that's crazy. So you had to run and gun that whole. You only had half a day. Yeah, that whole stick up at the beginning of the movie was shot in half a day. Yeah. Uh, but all, all to say, to finish the point, it's like the the reason we were able to do that is because with this film in particular. Um, the cinematographer Mike McLaughlin and I, who did a fantastic job and who's just like um, a great person to work with, and his, uh, his focus puller Ryan is just like a wizard. 
um, we decided we were going to go handheld and it was going to be very raw and the movie was going to be about the performances. It was obviously going to be about the tension and the kind of the real time thrilling qualities of it, but it was very much going to be about the performances. So, you know, you, uh, myself and Will sat around a lot, even in the middle of the day, which a shoot day, which is a luxury and talk through scenes. We were able to do that because we weren't as focused on, on the look of the thing as much. It still looks beautiful. But uh, I think we struck a good balance. It does look great. I want to show, I think we have a clip here, um, a, a scene of, of you of you and Will, uh, Mark, that I kind of want to do, uh, want to have a little look at here. Let's see if it comes up. Let's see if Hans is still there. All right. <laughs> No one saw it. That was, that was a friend's. A friend? Yeah. What are you doing? I was just gonna, I was gonna borrow Pop's car. You're gonna borrow the car? Yeah. What is it? Light on you? Huh? What's wrong? No, hey, I'll just, I'll, hey, I'll, you, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna explain are you later. Okay? Okay? Are you no, okay? I'm gonna see you later. I'm hey, 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 wait, 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 wait. Chris! Oh. Chris! Oh. Chris! Oh. Chris, oh. tell me. Tell me. Answer me. What happened? Are you okay? It's bad. It's bad. It's really bad. It's bad. Yeah, you don't understand. I, was, I don't understand. Just tell me. There was a, just, there was a girl. She was on my bike. Right. And she fell off. And I tried to turn back to get her, but I, I couldn't. You left her? I had to. I couldn't carry her or the bags. What are you calling an ambulance? What? Just... What? She was shot. Yeah. Nice stuff. There's a real urgency in that scene and the whole movie that's like, Christian and I were talking about this earlier. Uh, it's like the, the, the panic. Another scene that really strikes me, for those of you who watch the film, is when you're you're in the home of the drug dealer and Laura Jean, the actress, is holding the baby and they're talking about how they almost lost this baby, you know, and the urgency that's going on in Mark's face with that's in, in your camera work and everything that's happening in that scene. Uh, it's like, it's at a, it, it gangbusters throughout the whole film and it's totally maintained and you never feel like it's, Mm -hmm. something that's arbitrary or that's ever done in an artificial way. Like talk to me a bit about that, Christian. Talk to me a bit about why. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a quick shout out to Jorge Weitz and Jeff Morrow. Jorge is the editor and uh, Jeff Morrow is the composer. Um, and you know, they are two great um, collaborators to have whenever you're creating tension in a film. Um, <clears throat> and Mike McLaughlin, obviously who we, often, who we already talked about is the DP. Um, you know, the, the looseness of the camera work really puts you in the situation. We're behind Mark for a majority of that. So we're in his point of view effectively. So we're kind of feeling the tension that he's feeling. Uh, it's a really interesting point in the movie for people at home because it's that great part in the movie where the two separate worlds that you've set up finally meet. And we realize, okay, well, this is where the film is going to go from this point onward. Uh, we've met Mark's character, Chris, who's done a drug deal in the woods that goes wrong. And we've met his father, who was uh, at home with his wife and saw Chris zip through in a motorcycle and then followed him to the grandfather's house. So, you know, you, you have both of these scenarios coming together and we're going to realize what kind of shape the film is going to take from here on in. Um, it's a particular interesting challenge for Mark as an actor, I think, because You've been putting on airs, I think, would you agree, Mark, a lot of, up to this point in the movie? You're trying to double cross a friend. You're trying to kind of like seem like calm and relaxed and, and have a certain strength to you. But yeah. 
but then you're obviously thrown into a moment of crisis and now you're faced with your father uh, who, who's already one step ahead of you. So you're a character who's kind of used to lying a lot and having to deceive people to get his own way, but it can be tough to do when you're faced with, with your old man when you, when you need his help. Yeah, it's, um, it's interesting because uh, I thought about this a lot and like, you know, um, uh, I think I think when you when you're at a vulnerable or a weak spot and you and you and you see one of your parents or even a sibling, but you see one of your parents like in this movie, and you're so weak and you're so vulnerable, you kind of revert back to being a kid with them again a little bit. I know I have in my life. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I can be like one day just chatting with my old man about whatever, and then all of a sudden I'm I'm scared that I'm sick or like you know what I mean like scared something's wrong with my daughter or something like that and all of a sudden I'm like dad please help me. like my voice is raised and everything like you just become a bit more like you're dependent on them. you need them and I think that's why that scene it comes at a really nice time in the movie like you paced it out really well where it's like yeah it's like he's been kind of double crossing you're not really sure what he's up to and then he just has this total vulnerable moment which we talked about a lot like him having like a panic attack thing which I think yeah. And you and I talked about this before, Christian, but it put you, not so much you like Chris now, but you understand, you're with him a bit more to follow him. Yeah, well, if you can see that he's, um, he can be vulnerable, I mean, character's vulnerability, as I'm sure you both know, it's like, it's a great way to endear an audience to you as a character. And uh, you do a great job of it in, in that scene. It's, uh, it's tough. When I was writing that scene, it was very challenging for me because I, I, for a lot of time, I was like, what could you possibly say to, to your old man to get him to follow you to a cornfield to like hide a body <laughs> that you're responsible for, for killing? Um, Personal and, experience. Yeah, well, what, so for me, it was kind of like where I arrived was more just that I think you would just come out and tell him. Um, you know, you, you're so panicked, you wouldn't try and lie at this point. You, the humanity is just on the surface. And because of that, he, uh, he agrees to help you. Um, you know, and it's a testament to both of your performances that I think hopefully most audiences buy that and are willing to go along with you because it played the wrong way. You don't want the audience at home being like, he would never follow him. Any parent would never do this. Um, yeah. yeah. But it's interesting. It's in the script, right? And it's in your, you can tell this guy, and this is a, you know, not to get super personal about all this, all, all this Christian, but I'm sure you guys must have talked about this in the process of no, making the movie. It's written all over your pitch document, you know, like the, that moment for me, I was like, oh, fuck. Like that father is done. And it got, you know, you learn more and I won't give too much away, but you learn more about the old man and mm -hmm. what he's capable of. Mm -hmm. And this is based on something super personal to you, obviously. It's sort yeah, of loosely... It's based on, uh, it's based on um, people I know, certainly. It's like, you know, people I know and are close with, uh, a young man had been through this um, experience himself. And originally I was thinking about making a, a movie about his... Like, I knew a young man who, who moved out west, got involved in crime, and has amazing stories. And originally I was thinking I would make a film about his rise and fall, but what interested me more, the more I dug was, you know, how his activities affected his parents. And because you often don't see films about how the parents are criminals or how the families of criminals are affected. So that seemed like really rich, fertile ground to explore. Like if we could use that as the spine of the film and attach more thrilling kind of pulpy elements, you'd have a, um, an original film. Um, yeah, and that's what we did. Did they, the people, obviously we're not talking about who they are, did people who, uh, do you still are you still in contact with them did they see it do, do, are they pissed did they understand or are they you know oh no i think it's all i think it's good the reception has been uh has been great and again it's uh extremely it's very loosely based um you know you use right. any relationship that you're aware of as a jump off point and once you begin writing uh every film takes on a life of its own same with right. mark and, and will i mean you know the characters are loosely based on people i know but um in talking uh, and collaborating with talented actors, they make the character their own and they bring ideas and energy to it in a way that it's like ideally better than you could ever have imagined. Um, you know, for, for Mark's character in particular, it's a tricky role because he's doing a lot of lying, he's doing a lot of deceiving in this movie, not necessarily because he wants to, but he's kind of forced to in order to try and get from point A to point B safely. 
So it was, it was important to have a character who had an innate likability about them. And uh, I think, you know, into Mark O'Brien. Uh, Mark definitely brings that. And I think, Mark, you probably brought a lot of yourself to this role. Would you, would you agree? Yeah, that's what I was saying. I think it's more interesting when it's, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, Alan, but like, you know how like as an actor, we all know, like growing up wanting to be an actor, you're kind of like, want to like be someone else and like try something. And yeah, it's fun, but sometimes it's just like, actually this is more like a bit, it would be more interesting if it is kind of, what if I was in this situation, like as me? And there's, and then there are differences too, but I thought that that was like just so important because it, it, but it was more of an objective thing, like the whole movie. If he was like villainous, and like I said, very rough and tumble, I think you wouldn't, it, Will's character's motivation wouldn't have been as strong. Mm -hmm. you'd be like, his son is like, why, this guy is like done. Like, well, I'm not gonna go through this, I've already lost him. But Chris is on the edge, he's not completely lost, I think, I think there's a feeling that it's like, he's smart and, and you know, the movie takes us in a direction, we see his motivations for doing this whole thing. But I think, uh, but it was interesting with you because when we were working together and Christian's so good at doing this of keeping you in line of what's happening, like we had a scene in a pawn shop. And I remember like- yeah, I was just thinking, of, just thinking of that scene with yeah. the lying and the, it's a moment where we're as an audience, and I'm not to cut you off, but it's a, it's a, it, the way it's shot, the way, the setup, because we all know those fucking people where you know they're lying to you. Mark, you and I know one very well there, we know you know they're lying to you and it's like they're but you still kind of got to go with them and that scene is a really interesting moment where it's like oh fuck they do tell yeah. the truth sometimes anyway sorry go ahead yeah no no you're right and steve lush and dd gillard rowling's play it so well and and the, but it's like and the just the tension that he has where Will's character's out on the phone and we're and i'm inside trying to do this thing and i've been lying to people and now people are like lying to me but Christian came over and then when Will comes in, I have to tell him what happened, which is, it's real. And Christian came over, he's like, I don't believe you. <laughs> he did a couple of things, he's like, I don't, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And I was like, okay. Cause, and I think it's like, that's what's great, keeping up consistency from a director where it's like, I had this right. sort of line and getting what I want the whole movie that mm -hmm. I kinda, I think probably fell into a bit of a pattern. And then you have someone kicking your ass being like, I kind of believe you. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. For the for the record, I wouldn't go to too many actors in the middle of a take and say I don't believe you. No, no, no. It's it's because you and I. I think it's another reason we have such a great shorthand. Like we know each other pretty well. That it's like <clears throat> it's not the type of thing you're supposed to say to an actor, but it it, it works and it, and it can cut right to the heart of the matter in a lot of ways. Um, if any, if only just to kind of shake you up and get you um, and reorient your thinking. I mean, sometimes. As a director, that's all you really need to do, I, I feel like, is just get the actor or the performer, whoever it is, outside of their head so they can kind of re-enter, they can re-enter the scene from a different perspective. I thought it was a director paying really good attention because it was exactly what I needed to hear. Like when you said it, I was like, what? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> Probably. I think that's funny though, like like for actors directing, like for you too, Alan, it's like, we, un we know actors, you kind of know what to say. And you directed me on Doyle and it's like, you know, you can see an actor from a hundred feet away and be like, I kind of think I know what they're going through because I've been there, we're good or bad. I always find it crazy, like for you, Christian, like, you know what I mean? Like when you aren't an actor, like, <laughs> I would be like, I don't know what to tell them. You know, the, the weird thing is though, I'm, um, I'm like, a, I'm a madman at the monitor. I'm like acting out the scenes there's like videos of me just like staring. I'm like saying the lines. I just look like a crazy person. I saw that. And, I did know. I did see that in my gun. Yeah, I don't know if that's good or bad. I mean, uh, uh, if something's working, I'd say just roll with it at this point. But uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's great. Um, we got to do a Q and A thing, Mark. I want to thank you for that brilliant wall behind you. Uh, I know, and I realize, and there's a. Uh, this is fake, obviously. You killed, you killed an albino caribou, way to go. He shouldn't have been there. <laughs> uh, anything, anything, anything else you want to say to Mark Christian? Uh, nothing, man, just thanks again. Always a pleasure. Uh, we'll be chatting again soon. All right, thanks guys. <laughs> See you buddy, thank you. Nice All right, I'm gonna get some of these questions here for you, Christian. Okay. Um, 
someone, Kim Dooley wants to ask you about your new project, Urchins. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. Oh, that you were, she said a bunch of nice things about you too, but. Who is asking this question, sorry? It's gone now. Uh, yeah, I'm, um, I'm writing a film called Urchins. This one's hard for me to talk about a little bit because it's, um, it's not fully along. Yeah, it's a, it's a period kind of like, um, I guess horror drama in the same way The Witch or something like that is kind of a horror. Um, it takes place in 1930s Newfoundland. Um, everyone is moving away from this kind of remote town. Um, and there's this extremely kind of poor family who are destitute, who don't want to leave, but are kind of forced like everyone else to go. Um, and then one day the daughter comes home and she brings uh, a seashell. She's always collecting things by the shore. And one day she brings an innocuous kind of seashell amongst her other uh, possessions. And it goes about her life. And uh, slowly but surely it starts driving the household mad. And we come to understand why that is and what this little girl's secrets intentions are, which we don't realize at the beginning. That's maybe all I will say right now. That's good. It, it kind of leads into something. Uh, that question was from Kim Dooley, by the way. Sorry, I forgot and uh, didn't want to do this action while you were talking. Um, it leads into something, though, for me. It's like, so what? And, and, and Stephanie Ferreira had a very similar question or a question that was on my mind, too, about genre. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, what? Is it a genre thing for you? Because I will show the trailer for Cast No Shadow in a minute, which is, I, I'd love to know what the genre is for that, uh, based on a novel and some poems and some thoughts and the, you know real creative thought. But like, for you, you write, sometimes you direct other people's writing. You, you, know, you mm -hmm. seem to be moving towards uh, a place where you're kind of creating this stuff for yourself. Like, what mm -hmm. is the thing that hooks you first? Like, what's the drive for you? story-wise, like is a genre, is it uh, an idea, is it a friend who's gone through an experience, you know? Yeah, it can be. I don't think there's any necessarily one thing other, other than, I, I will say I tend to work from theme a lot. I become interested in, in theme or like the idea of what a movie could be about, like what a larger theme could be about and whether or not that kind of like reinforces my worldview. Um, and it's like my ever-changing kind of worldview. You know I mean as you grow, you're 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 like you're interpreting the world in your own way, and you're discovering what your perspective on it is. So it's like I'm looking for something or an idea that maybe I even surprise myself with what my interest might be, and then uh, usually I'll just try and like attach a story to that if that makes sense. No, I want to know what that means. Like you know, the you know people talk about. People fucking talk about theme and writing all the time. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're like, uh, I think you know you're talking about it. And other times I think you've just said this because someone told you you're supposed to say this or you're just mm -hmm. trying to get through a pitch. But like, what do you mean? Like, what kind of theme? I'm, just gonna, turn, the I'm gonna turn on the light for one second. Okay. <laughs> it's getting dark in here. You look great. Thank you. Like, and is the theme something you're talking about, the, like from the perspective as a writer, then I get it, whatever, well, like in terms of what well, you want to film. I'll use Hammer as an example, like. Great. I mean, theme is an, is an amorphous kind of concept. Everyone kind of defines it differently, whether or not I'm doing it right or wrong, now I'm not sure, but it's just kind of a driving <laughs> idea. Like with Hammer, I love the idea of like, parents realizing that they're, son was maybe involved in crime and never fully admitting it to him or to themselves because they loved him or, or they loved this person and how that little lie that you tell yourself to protect someone you love how that can lead to maybe like burying a body you know that's what happens in hammer so the idea like the theme that has to do with um um just say uh hammer and family the idea of telling someone what you feel the idea of like coming out with the truth about how you feel about someone, how that's like productive in life. And if you don't, how bad things can happen. Like that was a really interesting central theme that I could explore and expound on. Cool. Yeah. And is there, a, is there something you look at? Cause you know, Mark was uh, saying earlier about me as a director, I'm not a director. And uh, I mean, maybe there's a part of me somewhere, but it's not when I work with directors like you, with great directors and I've had the pleasure of doing a bunch. 
of, with some great people. It's like, you know, they know what they're looking As a writer, running a show is different than being a director of a film or a director of a series, you know. Uh, you know, what do you look for? What's your inspiration in terms of what's your process of like, well, how do you see it, I guess? And how, how do you explain that? You know, is there a way to explain that or? Well, no, I think like anything, like a lot of it comes from just like being like, I guess a cinephile or like having the whole history of all the films you've watched. Um, you know, like some people, I think directors are, are have that readily available in their consciousness. You know, they can see ideas or like they can read a book or come up with ideas and they have all of these films that they've watched on the ready. And, you know, the ability to kind of like pull from different films and, and put them together is what separates you from other, other directors, I think, is part of it. I am um, right. That's part of an answer. Sorry, I, I lost. I lost. Tell me again what the question is. Oh, I mean, what my question was. Yeah. Sorry, you were just asking. Sorry about about the process, basically. Was well, it? No, I mean you're answering it. I'm just wondering, like, how you see it. You sit down before. And my my question was probably convoluted, and I apologize. But I am curious oh. about it from the perspective of the director. It's like how how do you feel like you 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 see. Do you see what it is you're trying to do before you do it? Uh, you storyboard all that kind of stuff, but can you see the picture in your head of what the film wants to be, or is, are you like more of a fluid kind no, of director? I, and you... I, think, I think that's true. I would almost say, and this sounds kind of artsy fartsy, but I would say I almost feel it more than see it. Um, like I kind of like, I can definitely like, just like in terms of like music and tone, I often kind of work from like theme and tone. Like I've just from an early age, had a for whatever reason an ability to like create a tone in a piece whatever tone i kind of wanted and that's right. something that i think a lot of directors or non-directors probably struggle with that ability to come up with a tone and then execute it accordingly um you know sometimes they're trying to find it in the edit room sometimes they're leaning heavily on music whatever it may be um i just for whatever ability kind of know how i want my my movies to feel in advance and so based on my knowledge of like you know, film history or my own experiences, I, I'll have a sense of what music I want, what kind of cameras I want to use, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the cameras thing has always blown my mind. I'm going to look for another question here, right? Mm -hmm. uh, someone wants to know, and I, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer this question. Someone wants to know if you can buy or uh, just hammer, the film hammer. Mm -hmm. And obviously the answer to that is yes, you can get it on iTunes and you can get it on Rogers, you said, and Crave. Yeah, in the States, it's on, um, it's Amazon Prime, um, iTunes, Apple TV, Vudu. Um, that's where it is in the States. And in Canada, it's like um, Rogers, Bell, Shaw, Eastlink, um, Microsoft. Uh, Everywhere you can buy films, really, right? Pretty much, yeah. Google Hammer and the movie and you'll probably find it. How, and it's doing um, it's doing really well, right? It, it, right now, yeah. it's it's yeah. It's been, it's been getting really good um, critical feedback, which is really nice. I mean, like any work, all you can hope for is that you know um, established people can articulate their thoughts in a meaningful way and interpret your work in a way that feels art articulate to you and. Hopefully they'll see a bunch of the things that you intended and were going for, whether that's subtext or even sometimes it's on, on the surface. Um, uh, and I've been really pleased with some, some great reviewers have really dug in. I guess I was afraid that people in a lot of ways were gonna see it as a nonstop, like thrilling action ride and not see the heart of the film and the thing that was most interesting to me, which is the father, son, or like again, the theme of secrets and lies. Um, that's at the, the, the that's at the core of the film. I was I was hoping people weren't going to just pass over it, uh, and they don't seem to have. They seem to be picking up on that for the most part. Um, so I'm uh, myself and my producing partners, especially Chris Agustin and Allison White. I think everybody's pleased because you know you'd like to say I don't care what people think, and uh, maybe you don't, but uh, validation doesn't hurt either. Well, also people seeing our work, right? And uh, it's so important and that's great. And it does do, it's a, you know, if you don't mind me saying, it does give, uh, 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 it does have that action element to it. Not that you're flipping cars and, and stuff, but 
there is an element action to it that an element of action to it that drives the plot with the tension that's there. But it, but it isn't just that for sure. There's a lot of substance to it. Yeah. I, I, I want Jim Mackey has a question. Um, hey, Jim uh, Mackey. Yeah. Uh, he says, "Great job on your on your sophomore film." He, he was wondering if is your has your director if or has your uh, how has your directing style changed since Cast No Shadow? Um, shout out to Jim Mackey first. <laughs> Great guy. Um, like Great I kind of like I mentioned earlier, I think the main thing is that um, I've been focusing on performance uh, more than anything. That's been my um, I'm still obviously very interested in, in the tone of the piece and how the piece looks. Um, you know, I'm very fortunate to be at a level where I can surround myself with people in every department who are great at what they do. Um, and so I think when I was younger, maybe not necessarily Castle and Shadow, but before that, I could never sit by the monitor and watch things because I was trying to micromanage everything and I was tense and I just like didn't know how to sit still and let the team do their job uh, and, and collaborate effectively. I tried to do everything myself. Uh, so over time now, um, I've really tried to focus in on making a direct connection with the actors and giving us the time and space to try things on set. Um, some that don't work, some that do, but make sure that they're comfortable and the dialogue is open and consistent. There was another question in there about, uh, and I'm loath to, uh, Actually, you know what? Let's show the, the clip to uh, Cast No Shadow, uh, your first feature, and, uh, and I'll hold that question till after. Okay. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's a troll's lair. I got books. This stuff goes way back. Trolls love gold more than anything. You can pay them off with gold. It's their only real weakness. Buddy Ricky broke his foot or his leg or something. Yeah, he uh, he fell. Where did these come from, by the way? I found them. You stole them. You stole them. People says you don't go to church because you're a witch or something. I suppose that's true sometimes. It's all we need now. It's her filling your head with more garbage. You think he needs you? Huh? Think he can't look after himself? He's a good side better at it than you are. That boy needs a lot more stability than what Angus got him into now. I know what the boy's been through. He might surprise you. I'm uh, sure he's full of surprises. What's this say about the hand of feeds? But all that weird shit down in the crawl space. The phones and sticks all painted gold. I got half a month apart and all that. No, 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 no. Is there something wrong with you? I saved him. I saw you hit him. Liar. Every word is stuck in your mouth. Any trolls around here too? I don't know. Maybe. Well, thank God. Uh, that's for, a great. Thank God for Percy Hines' voice. I was just gonna say, there's a star. There's a star in that kid. Uh, not a kid anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what a great performance he gives in that film too. Um, uh, there was a great question, and I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll come to it in a, in a bit, but talk to me about this film for people and where they can find it and, uh, and kind of a Cast little bit about it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Cast No Shadow uh, was made uh, in 2015. Uh, it, as we talked about earlier, just briefly, it was part of Microbudget's first, um, um, uh, or sort of Telefilm's first micro-budget program, so you get up to 250 grand to make a movie. So a uh, very, very small budget, uh, very ambitious project. I collaborated on that uh, with a friend of mine, Joel Thomas Hines, uh, extremely talented uh, writer, actor. Um, and he, and, uh, he plays the father in the movie, so he and his boy, his real life son, Percy Hines White, um, got to act together, which was just uh, amazing. 
Um, my producing partners, Allison White and Chris Agustin, uh, worked on me with that as well. We've worked on several now. They also did Hammer. So that was our first kick at trying something on kind of like a large scale for very little money. And uh, it was received really well. As you can see, there was nominated for some Canadian Screen Awards, including Best Picture. And it was a chance for all of us to just basically like um, stretch our wings a bit and, and be ambitious. Uh, what was the budget for it? Do, do you talk about that stuff? Yeah, no, it was two hundred and fifty k. Yeah, yeah. I should have known that. Um, but the so the the question that was asked by Andrew, wh what do you do to build trust from cast and crew? Which I think is a great question mm -hmm. because when you're going into a corner like this with some child actors, you know, Percy's parents, obviously, like you mentioned, uh, Joel is. Mm -hmm. Everyone knows who Joel Hines is, and Sherry White is a you know, tour de force as a writer and director. Mm -hmm. So Percy's been brought up in the business in a yeah. you know, pretty profound way with some pretty great uh, role models. But if you're bringing some kids into something like this and then you're trying to get all of these pros uh, to jump on board with a, a shoestring budget and you know, mm -hmm. they're in it for the art. So what do you do to kind of to build their trust and inspire them, that kind of thing? Such a big part of it. Well, I guess first of all, I mean, just be a decent human being, I would say is like a good tenant to start with, which we should take for granted, but on film sets in the past, it's not always, always the case. So I try to pride myself on being a decent person. Um, I think part, it kind of is tied into like I, I've talked about before, like when I was younger versus now, I try not to control people, try to let them do their jobs and instill them with the confidence to do their jobs properly. Try not to micromanage them. I think that's a good skill in life to have in general. I try mm. to bring that onto a set. Um, you know, even in the materials though, even in the script, and then a lot of directors will make lookbooks and then you'll have pre-production meetings where you're talking about um, either you're rehearsing with the actors or you're gonna like, what shirt is he gonna wear? Whatever those things are. I mean, you just need to do your homework and speak with confidence. You know, people want to feel like the person running the ship has thought about what he's doing and uh, can speak confidently and calmly. And so I try to just try to do that in, in a really kind of basic way and not micromanage people. When did you figure that out? The it's, an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. I, uh, I think... Um, I don't know. It, it, it took a minute. It took a minute, probably on Cast No Shadow, I would say, um, you know, because when you're working with people who like um, who are a little more established than you are, whether it's crew or whether it's someone like Joel and stuff, too. I mean, you know, you can do yourself a favor by listening to what these people have to say. Uh, you know, again, it comes down to being a decent person. Uh, yeah, just like, you know, when you're new and you're working with people who have been there and done that, um, you know, you want to be confident, you want to be prepared, but at the same time, uh, it's good to listen. Cool. I, I want to just get some more questions out here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All good. There, were, there, there was a problem in my bio I left in that there was a season three of Frontier that is, um, we already did that. <laughs> I didn't right. update my bio. No text from the lawyer. Have you ever had difficulties with an actor? Um, and uh, figure out what you need, uh, and had to figure out what they needed from you. Mm -hmm. How did you find the solution? I mean, yeah, I have. I'm in a short film once. I won't say which one. And. Um, we had, there was a lead actor in it, and in, the, in one of the last scenes of the movie, he had to get very, very emotional uh, and had to basically break down and sob and beg for um, forgiveness or his life or whatever the case was. And um, the actor just wasn't emotionally there. Uh, he just wasn't like willing, he just couldn't get inside the emotion that was required in the moment. I don't know if he didn't do his homework or whatever. And I was younger and I honestly didn't know what to say to him. And the scenes didn't work and the movie didn't work. Uh, so yes, I have, uh, I have had issues. It, it can be tough, like I mentioned before. It's like, uh, you know, speaking with actors is, um, you know, I think we live in a culture where movies like the visuals are praised first and foremost. 
and you have a lot of young filmmakers who are getting good cameras and good gear and want to make something look cool, which is great, it's a visual medium, but how to talk to actors uh, is an acquired skill that you can only get by, in repetition, in my opinion. Um, you know, maybe it's different these days because you can watch videos on YouTube and all that stuff, but when I was starting off, it certainly wasn't the case. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Um, also, also an ongoing process. Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of amazing though. I was a little nervous meeting Will because Will, I had grown up watching uh, uh, Will, had been a, a big fan. And so when I heard that he was interested in doing the movie, uh, and it was like, Will, Will Patton's interested in the movie. He's going to call you at 8 p.m. And so I was sitting there, home. There was a question there. Did you have Will in mind, Mark in mind? So, yeah, I was going to ask you that. But, yeah, go ahead. You were waiting for him to call you. Yeah, Will was one of the top names on our, our list. Um, again, I, uh, you'll probably like this. When we were younger, you know, you could only often watch movies on Channel 10 on ASN. And so we used to uh, take movies onto VHS and, and keep and, and like log them in a Hillroy exercise, our like movie collection. And I had a copy of No Way Out that Will was in that got like worn out over many years. And uh, so I always loved his performance in that and tracked him over the years. So yeah, so we, we sent it out uh, to the casting director, sent it out to his people. He responded that he really liked it. And uh, they said, Will's gonna call you at 8 p.m. So I was pacing around my apartment, and then you that, and then the phone rings. That gravelly voice picks up on the other end, and as you can imagine, you know, as you're going in your career, little moments like that mean a lot. And uh, unsurprisingly, extremely down to earth, um, lovable. I consider him a really, really close friend. We talk all the time. Still, um, I was very fortunate to, to get well. He's wonderful in the movie, and and. Um... He, we were discussing this a little bit earlier with Mark, but it's in the writing and, and it's clearly something he really uh, was able to highlight. His past, you know, without, uh, we never hear it. We mm -hmm. hear about it. We never, we don't know if it's true or not. Maybe I, I've endowed his character with it, but his ability to kind of lay out those layers of, yeah, well, that was, that's tricky. I mean, the, 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 one of the trickiest parts of writing this film, I think, is like when you have a film that's so propulsive and it starts at 11 and it continues and it's real time, more or less, you know, you, and, and there's people after you with a gun and like someone's dead and it's like there's bags of money. There's not much time to sit around and talk about, you know, band camp or like when we were when you were a child and these things. So it's like, how do I how do I very simply um, insert moments of exposition so that the audience gets a sense of who the characters are without trying to overdo it. Some people feel like we'll watch a movie like this and feel like they wanted more. For other people, it'll feel like it's just enough. Um, uh, yeah, that was, that, was, that was a tricky balance, um, but hopefully, hopefully people uh, think it paid off. Well, I think you accomplish it in a really cool way. Um, there's also this layer that I found like fucking hilarious. It's like, because these characters have all known each other for their entire lives, really, mm -hmm. there's uh, there's this element when Will shows up with the with the bad guys where they're like, they see their friend's dad, you know? Yeah, like Mr. Of, Mr. Davis, yeah. Yeah, they get fucking polite with him. It's like, and I, you know, where we grew up, I just remember someone could be screaming at uh, someone else and someone's father comes up and they're like, Yes. They just get they just get so polite with the parent. Anyway, I just thought that was really it's subtle, but it's in, and he handles that authority well. He does. That's Curtis Caravaggio playing Samson. He's a really really great actor, and uh, yeah. brings that, brings some levity to the movie as well, dark though it is. Um, but that's great. I mean, that's a good thing. I, I love how in, in any character. I mean, I think that happens with a lot of the characters in the movie. It's like they sometimes flip who you think they're going to be. It certainly happens like. I won't give away too many spoilers, but the character Chris that Mark is playing, you know, we think he's still being selfish in the movie, but you know, uh, two thirds of the way through, you realize maybe his intentions are different. Uh, you know, the father at the beginning of the movie, you feel like obviously a very noble old school teacher, and he is, but you also realize as the movie goes that he's far from imperfect too, and has maybe helped, his complacency has maybe helped sh shape the person that Chris became. And it's true for the Samson character that Curtis, who you just mentioned as well, it's like 
he can be the toughest guy on the street and have killed people before, but he's also kind of polite when it comes to an old teacher. Oh yeah, and I, I mean it's a, it's a, you know it's reverence. I, we got this great note from someone on an oil rig uh, off the coast of Newfoundland. The Wi-Fi is brutal, but he wanted to send a quick message in case he gets booted off. He's so proud of you. Hmm. Didn't say who he was. You know, and this is a question I was kind of asking you earlier. This is from a, an anonymous person. Have you learned anything from other directors' work or process that you found useful and applied to your own process? Like I have that as a writer, like when you read a script from Carlton Cuse, you know, I'm like, oh shit, I, that, oh, I like how he, oh, that, that's, oh, you know, really resonates with you. Mm -hmm. Do you have that with directors? Like, is that a, yeah, I think so. I mean, the odd thing is, like, as a director, especially in a small town or someone who's tended to work in a bit of a vacuum the way I have, I don't really see other directors work or I don't really know how they direct. So it's like, I mean, I went to film school and I went to the Canadian Film Center, so I'm not like a total babe in the woods, but it's like... But I, you can uh, watch a movie and you know, I mean, you're yeah. pretty, you know, you're, you, know, you know what you're watching, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, go ahead. No, for sure. I um, But all to say, it's like one great thing about um, uh, technology and the way it's going is you can, there's just endless resources online where you can watch people talk about uh, their process yeah, um, and, and how they do it. So I, like, like most directors or, or most film buffs, I do that kind of all the time. Um, and, you know, in, in, in my limited experience with other directors, I think the main thing that I learned is just preparation. I mean, you just really want to be prepared. You really want to know your story. It's amazing. I think not amazing, but there's certainly some directors out there who I think um, it's easy to become complacent sometimes and be maybe a little bit unprepared. So it's a, it's a good lesson never to do that. Cool. No, that's cool. Um, Karen Bruce wants to know first John and Sam said that they love you. Um, I don't know who John and Sam are. Um, Shout out to John and Sam. Thanks, guys. Love you, too. Yeah. Um, Karen Bruce wanted to know uh, how far along you are in Sweetland, your next project. So, uh, the Michael, uh, mm -hmm. you, but you, I don't know. I can't remember if we talked yeah, about it off camera. Yeah. To say that, uh, to say that that is like the next project, I feel like is, we should clarify, it's looking quite good right now. I've, um, the, the novel has been optioned. I've written the screenplay. Um, we've been talking to a bunch of people. So things are lining up quite nicely, knock on wood. Um, it's all pretty much ready to go in a lot of ways, except for the, um, for, for the casting. And obviously, you know, we need to finalize the funding and all stuff. But all the prep and the vision and, and the approach and all that is ready to go. Um, and for people who don't know, Michael, Michael Crummy, um, the author of Sweetland, is a renowned Newfoundland author, Newfoundland's greatest current author, in my humble opinion. Um, and this is a book about modern day resettlement in Newfoundland. You know, um, not everyone across the country even knows what resettlement is. Um, but it's basically, you know, the government is paying everyone in this small Newfoundland town, an outpour community that is basically survives on the fishery. When the fishery dies and the, and the towns are kind of dwindling and people are moving away, the government pays everyone a hundred grand to leave. Uh, but it only holds, people only get the money if everyone agrees. But there's one holdout, an old stubborn old bastard named Moses Sweetland who doesn't want to go. And uh, ultimately, ultimately agrees, um, but gets cold feet at the last minute. Everybody moves away. He hides out on the plains above the town and then comes back and lives in this town on his own and slowly starts kind of like losing his mind a little bit, starts seeing lights on in houses, starts seeing specters on a headland of Newfoundlanders past. It's a really beautiful story that's like part survival tale, part ghost story, and part elegy to a dying culture. You know, Newfoundland, not a lot of people realize, but rural Newfoundland is choking and sputtering. Uh, the tourism ads are great, uh, but that's only one side of the province. You know, there's a very real issue going on um, with people leaving. So this novel is a great testament to its history and kind of um, and kind of just tackles that issue in a really beautiful poetic way. And, you know, for you now, there was a thing that happened, you know, for me, 
most of my career, I wanted to tell Newfoundland stories. I wanted to write Newfoundland stories. You know, I got to adapt Lisa's novel, Lisa mm -hmm. Moore's novel. Uh, that was like a, such a famed story from our, from the, the lore of our, you know, childhood um, and stuff like that based on real stuff and, you know, but I, you know, I'm, I'm at a place as a writer and I don't know where you, as, the questions for you as a filmmaker and as a writer, like, does it have to be about here or are you? Like, I've, kind of, it's funny. I've kind of been the opposite. I've gone in the opposite trajectory. Like, um, and I think it's true for a lot of people um, our age, it really depends on the person. But um, I grew up kind of wanting to get as far away from Newfoundland as I could uh, in a lot of ways. Because I grew up just watching like American movies. Um, you know, in St. John's, you just didn't have access to anything other than what was at National Video. And that was like, you know, a small selection. Um, so it was just what I knew and like the movies and stories I wanted to tell um, weren't necessarily reflective of Newfoundland. And it's only in the past 10 years or so that I realized, you know, what a big part um, of my identity in Newfoundland actually is. What an amazing and beautiful place it is. And uh, it's a thing that kind of makes us interesting and unique in a lot of ways. Um, and I've found ways, whether it's going to be adapting something like Sweetland or telling my own stories, to kind of uh, make people more aware around the world of, of what Newfoundland is actually about. And there's so many parts of, you know, there's the Joel version of uh, um, Newfoundland, Joel Hines version of Newfoundland, where his, you know, my favorite thing of Joel's, I think, of all time. <laughs> is a uh, fuck Signal Hill, fuck. Uh, Manifesto, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he, he left that in the, in the, on the, on the windshield wiper of my truck and the uh, inscription was fuck you, Hako, and yes. fuck your fucking show. Nice, uh, yeah. yeah. He was in yeah. the show at the time, uh, but, uh, <laughs> and he did say, I would have put that in the book, but I published it before you got your show greenlit. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but there's there's so many sides of what we are, you know, and I, I'm a, a real, um, uh, I grew up in a, definitely in the, in the, in a darker side of it. And, mm -hmm. but, you know, I, I still can't get past the light. Like I'm really into the light and, you know, Hammer is, did you shoot all of that here in Newfoundland? No, no, that was, it's majority of it is Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. See, fuck, that's what I thought. And, uh, yeah. but there are parts of it that look, yeah, no, there, it was shot in Newfoundland as well. The pawn shop sequence is Newfoundland. And then the kind of like the hitman um, uh, baby and couch sequence is, uh, is Newfoundland as well. And the, yeah, so everything outside their house is like old tops of roadish kind of stuff. Is that where you were? Um, sorry, no, everything, no, everything else is Sault Ste. Marie. No, no, sorry, outside the hitman's house. No, that's kind of like, um, What's the name of the street? It's downtown, like uh, right around like um, Brother Egan Soccer Field and Labatt Brewery. Right, right. It's one of those streets. Right, right. Yeah. And what, yeah, so like the, and you know, in your growing up and shit like that, for you personally, I'm talking about, did you, you had friends and uh, did you ever feel like it, that world was attractive to you at all? For you? Which world story, like Newfoundland or the harder side of it? No, no, the hammer side of it, the, the darker side of the, the, the crime stuff. Like, I was around it, like, growing yeah. up, you know, yeah? Was that appealing yeah. to you? I think so. I mean, I certainly live, like, I'm not going to sit here and say I lived in, like, the, the, the toughest neck of the woods ever, but it was definitely, like, like, people around us were middle class or lower middle class, so... It's definitely a world that I'm I'm aware of pretty intimately. I mean, I actually grew up not far from you. I grew up in Sesame Park because you're the ghouls. Uh, so I'm just down just down the road and across the river in Boring Park there from you. Um, See, they, people were rich over there. I I, I can't even count. I mean, the people in high school went to like either are from like Kilbride or uh, um, up behind the village who went to Beaconsfield. So it's not exactly Ivy League. I know, I know. And does that inform like? back to the stories, you know, the, the tone or, or the themes we talk about. For me personally, I always had a criminal element of storytelling I like to do. Is that like some, is, is that side of the world, the darker side of what we come from, is that sort of a like a, a beacon of light for you in terms of inspiration? Um, 
or is it just coincidence? You know, I think, I think it's just coincidence. I mean, again, because I was, um, I knew the person uh, associated with this story in particular and, and their journey and the relationship to their family that this one appealed to me because I knew it intimately. But in general, I'm definitely drawn to darker materials. Like, I mean, Cast No Shadow is a darker kind of movie. Um, I, you know, one of my shorts that did really well is about a, a group of kids who find a monster in the woods and have a great day. And then the monster turns and chases them all, <laughs> eats them all in the woods. So I'm definitely not doing a romantic comedy anytime soon. Um, I'm not sure why that is. I feel like I'm generally a pretty um, optimistic, outgoing, pleasant person. I tend to not kind of question uh, my inspirations or, or my style too much. I feel like if something is, if you're lucky enough that you have a style or tone that is working, then you should just ride that hard and not question it too much. All right, buddy. That's great. Um, yeah. Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, obviously watch Hammer, right? And I was wrong, it's not on Crave. Allison texted me and, and uh, it's uh, on iTunes for sure. Just give the list again where you can buy Hammer right now. Yeah, so in, in Canada, it's on um, uh, iTunes, uh, Rogers, Bell, Shaw, Eastlink, uh, Microsoft. And in, in uh, the US, it's on um, iTunes, Apple TV, um, Amazon Prime, uh, Voodoo, yeah. Great, and I, I do recommend everybody uh, to give it a great a watch. It was a, it's, a, it's a real great film, and I'm very, uh, very happy for you, man. Yeah, well, thanks, brother. Thanks so much for doing this, and thanks to the DGC. It's been fun. No, man, it's my pleasure. And Hans, there he is, the man. I'm here. Thank you so much, guys. That was fantastic. And full disclosure, Newfoundland is one of my favorite places. I can't wait to go back and visit you guys there. That was fantastic. Christian Allen, thank you so much for that generous and candid and inspiring conversation. Fantastic. Great. Thanks, uh, Thanks, Hans. Watch, watch both those films, Cast No Shadow and Hammer. They're absolutely amazing. Um, I appreciate it. For those of you uh, uh, in the audience, please join us Thursday night for a master class featuring Claude Pere, DGC designer of Mega Spider Man, Planet of the Apes, among others. Um, it continues to be a great ride, and we hope it's providing some relief, some entertainment, and no doubt inspiration in these incredibly challenging times. Be safe, be well, be kind. Have a great night. Christian, Alan, thank you so much for spending this time with us. Okay, take care guys, take care everyone. Talk to you soon, bye-bye.